All right, so I'm here in, uh, how do you pronounce uh, this, this part of Florida? Well, I live out in a country, so this really doesn't have any name here, but, uh, <laughs> but we're close to a town, a small town of Umatilla, uh -huh. uh, which is outside of Eustis, kind of uh, halfway between Orlando and uh, Ocala. All right. So, all right, guys, sorry about the weird introduction, but this is another episode of A Taboo Life, and I want to thank you guys again for listening. I have a really great guest today. I'm really excited about me and me coming to his uh, house here. Um, I'm gonna have him introduce yourself, and I'm gonna have him introduce himself, and then I'm gonna tell you why I'm interested in talking to him. So, go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Lucas, uh, spelled with K, Novotny, N-O-V-O-T-N-Y. I was born in Czechoslovakia, former Czechoslovakia, now Czech Republic, uh, back in 1961. I immigrated to United States in 1980 through, uh, 1982 mm -hmm. via uh, Greece, um, uh, in, where I stayed in a refugee camp, came to the States in 1983. Been here ever since, naturalized, moved around a little bit, starting in California, through Ohio, North Carolina, and to Florida. Um, trained as an artist, studied at the University of Applied Arts. Um, that's how I initially made the living, actually, in fact, here in, in, in America. Later on, I got disenchanted with the modern art world, which is full of confusion, and uh, <laughs> uh, we can cover that later. <laughs> it's like, why? Uh, yeah. Why, why is a banana and, uh, on a especially wall? Especially the conception, yeah, exactly. <laughs> why is a banana on a wall? Can't make, yeah, exactly. <laughs> If I can't make out what it is, why am I supposed, you know, so anyway, I'm supposed to believe whatever some, somebody writes about it. Um, and so I got into archery because I could still be an artist in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. Make, you know, it, it's an instrument, nonetheless, you can make it pleasing and, and the sort of the, the, the topical treatment of the, of the archery equipment, uh, you know, can be very artistic. And, uh, and you cannot really fool anybody with a bad bow. If it mm. doesn't shoot well, then obviously. And it's not like the banana, you know, taped to the wall. Thing. The banana okay, so, um, so I got into archery. Mm -hmm. And eventually I got into horseback archery as well. And um, I, I competed around the world, not just in horseback archery, ground archery as well. I taught horseback archery around the world. And so that's where I'm actually now, although kind of in the process of actually retiring from active um, competing in horseback archery, picking up some painting lately, again, uh, sort of that artist in me is coming out again, but doing it on my own terms, not having to worry about selling it in a gallery. And so still relying on the bows as the primary source of income and livelihood, which I still love making bows. So. <laughs> I'm excited. So that's basically the history of. Yeah, I'm excited about taking a look at your bows because I was looking on your website. Yeah. They're beautiful bows, and I brought and I brought my bow to show uh, Lucas today too. So he's probably going to think this is pretty cheap. But <laughs> no, it's <laughs> like, okay. The reason why I'm excited about actually interviewing you because um, since I've been wanting to get an archery for a long time, and the last part of uh, last year, I finally got into. I decided to go train in Mongolian archery. I've been mm -hmm. training myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, your video from, I guess, CNN did a video yeah, on yeah, the, the, yeah, the channel. I was watching it. I was like, stuff. man, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so he does horse horseback archery. Yeah. And um, why, don't you, why don't you explain what is that? Okay. It's basically archery combined with horseback riding, simply put. It's an ancient martial arts discipline. They used to call it a queen of martial arts. Mm -hmm. back in, in fact, for example, in Japan, before the um, peaceful period of when the uh, shogunates were actually being united, starting under Hideyoshi. Before that, prior to that, uh, it was called the way of the bow. So the primary weapon of a samurai was actually bow and arrow. Really? It was not really the sword at all. The well, sword I, was a sidearm. Yes. It was a backup weapon. Because I know, it was a backup weapon. The, I remember reading my history that the Cantana was a backup weapon, but the mm -hmm. primary weapon was the long staff, right? No, it no. was actually bow and arrow. Oh, that That's okay. how they rode out and fought. You know, all, all the rest. Of course, they were trained in using the the katana. They were trained to use the the spear. I, I forget the names of those things. You know, mm -hmm. they, they all have particular names. But anyway, so and then of course everybody's aware of Genghis Khan, mm -hmm. right? Or Genghis Khan, um, a Mongol warlord from the 1200s who united the Mongolian tribes and conquered basically. I was probably the largest empire ever. Not even a Rome could 
could basically rival it because it was from China all the way to Europe. And uh, in fact, they've managed to go all the way to the gates of Vienna through the Balkans, but because of the death of uh, 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 Ogadei Khan, mm -hmm. they had to return for uh, back to Mongolia for Kraltai, which is the election of the Khan, and so the, the conquest of Europe basically stopped right there. So that's what saved Europe uh, from the Mongol hordes. But um, yeah, so uh, it was it was the and then. Uh, What's amazing about horseback archery, because of the tactics that they used, and, and, and a bow and arrow is a, sort of a primary weapon, mm -hmm. um, it was kind of a blitzkrieg, so then we go into World War II, and all the, even before, prior to that, the, the tactics of Genghis Khan were studied, obviously, yeah. um, in uh, military academies uh, for, for the longest time, and till today, you know, they're studied. Uh, yeah, so. I remember, I, there's this podcast uh, called... Um, Hardcore History, mm -hmm. and it's by this guy named Dan, Dan Carlin, and he did a, a entire series called The Wrath of the Khans. Mm -hmm. It's a five episodes, each episode's like four or five hours mm -hmm. just studying the Khans. Right, it's right. just amazing how, yeah. what happened in that small period of time. Exactly. I read a lot of these books. There are wonderful books out there on the subject. Um, um, it's very intriguing to sort of see, uh, you know, mo most of us think about Genghis Khan, and uh, he was a basically illiterate man uh, mm -hmm. but uh, extremely intelligent because he was able to unite the tribes create a language for the mongols using other people and other people's cultures uh, to advance his ideas and his empire you know pony express paper money uh, all these things opened the roots. Basically, a renaissance happened because of Genghis Khan. Yeah, the Silk okay. Road, right? The Silk Road, yeah. He opened it up, made it safe. You know, not that it wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. Okay, It was, but there was already trading going on. But he made it really safe. Yeah, because it said that a woman could walk from one end of the Silk Road to the other mm -hmm. and see so nothing would happen to her because yeah. while he was around. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So he brought lots of good things uh, 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 into the world and, and uh, basically kind of the civilization civilization surged forward because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of bad things that they did, but yeah, we he didn't. Was, in the, he was genocidal. Those were different times. You know, <laughs> we look at it as, oh, these people are so cruel. Well, you know, we don't have to look that far into the history to find yeah. that um, we can. We're all capable under uh, the right circumstances to do very bad things. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can. You know, we're certainly capable of that. So yeah, anyway. it was that phrase the. Uh, the line between good and evil runs through every person's heart. Yep, yep. That's it. That's just the nature of a man, you know. We're not perfect. Mm -hmm. So, Mongolian horseback archery, how did you get into it? Uh, well, okay, that's long story short. Um, when I was growing up as a child, mm -hmm. back in Czech Republic, there was a serious... Um, by a German author whose name was Karl May, mm -hmm. and he wrote this series on uh, this um, Indian chief whose name was Vinatu. It was an Apache. It was a made-up story, but never mind. Uh, and his uh, friend, who was called uh, the nickname, was given by the Indians, Old uh, Shatterhand. He had such a hard punch that he could knock a person out with one blow. Okay, so, and uh, so this, and, and he was original, I think, German or something like that. And and so they, these two became friends, and the, the whole story is built around that friendship. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they made movies. Uh, I think it was like back in late '60s, early '70s, and and I read all the books and. You know, I, so every child in Europe actually they're crazy about the Indian and cowboy stuff. Okay, so of course I was playing the Indian cowboy stuff, and that probably how initially this interest started by reading and getting to know the, the especially the Plains Indian culture. Because since I was a child, I loved horses. I was a small kid. Uh, the very first thing that I ever drew, okay, uh, I no longer have that drawing. I have some very very old drawings from when I was a child. Mm -hmm. But my grandmother told me before she passed that um, I drew a horse and a turtle, okay? So, and I was yeah. apparently two or three years old. Okay, so I, I can't vouch for that, but that's what my <laughs> grandma said, okay? <laughs> anyway, 
uh, I, I obviously exhibited like artistic abilities from an early age. That's why I ended up, you know, um, at, at an art school later on in my life, uh, going through uh, adolescence. And um, so that kind of that was the seed. Okay. Of course, growing up under communism, I had a wonderful childhood, even though that I grew up under communism. Because as a child, you don't really recognize. If you have nothing to compare it to, you do not recognize things, uh, uh, you know, uh, as being necessarily bad. You know, obviously, as I grew older I, and I saw how the society was structured and how things worked, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But being a child, you don't worry about these things. You know, I, I ran outside with other kids. You know. We played war, Indians, cowboys, uh, three musketeers, <laughs> yeah. whatnot. You know, we made our weapons. You know, we, we didn't have cell phones to stare into. You know, and uh, so um, that was a kind of a childhood that I had, and uh, that kind of stayed with me. Um, I went through the schooling. I went to the uh, the middle school, um, arts and crafts school. Um, it was specifically oriented towards glass because I come from a particular part of the country that it's steeped in the history in glass making, going back to medieval times. Yeah. And part of my family was in it, involved in it in one, one way or another. And so I kind of naturally took that route. And so, you know, you got 15, 16, your interests kind of change. You know, you're looking, you're looking at girls and you know, the, <laughs> the normal stuff the boys do, right? <clears throat> and uh, then I applied to go to the University of Applied Arts in Prague, this famous school where this... Um, a very famous professor taught, very well recognized, even in this country, mm -hmm. if you know anything about a modern uh, glass, especially. His name was uh, Libensky, Stanislav Libensky, and I studied under him. But I did not finish the studies. And this was in 1982. <clears throat> well, I went to school in 1980. I didn't get in the first time because this, going back to the political regime there, my parents were never members of the Communist Party. So although I found out later I had the best talent exam that year, I was at, right at the top, which should get me into the school, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't good enough because my parents were not members of the party. Instead, the two girls got in who couldn't draw a straight line, but their parents were high up in a Communist Party. Yeah. Okay. So I, we actually had to use bribery because this kind of system breeds corruption. Mm -hmm. You know, give a fat envelope to a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, a minister of culture who then signed up the paper wow. to get me in okay and that was only because we had some connection through somebody else uh, in between person and you know go in between person anyway so that's how I got into the school basically uh, through corruption <laughs> hey. I didn't have to do that because my t talent exam was the best but mm -hmm. that didn't matter so never finished the school and then came to the States uh, and uh, we had to go to the refugee camp, which that alone is a, a long story uh, there. You know, it was pretty tough. That made me grow up, actually, because I was 21 at the time. And I got to the States. And the archer was kind of on a back burner. You know, you're trying to get established. I didn't speak any English. It was my father and I who came here first. Mm -hmm. And then it took another five years to get my mother out of, uh, Czech, out of Czechoslovakia. Wow because they didn't really they signed the helsinki agreement it was about in regards to human rights in 1970s i forget when 77 i believe it was mm -hmm. but they the communists never really held on to anything they signed just like hitler didn't yeah know? so uh and american government was telling us look we can't really do anything unless your government uh, uh, wants something from us like technology then we can bargain with them and that's eventually how we got my mother okay sidetrack here because we're talking about archery at the moment. No, this is pretty interesting, so keep going. Yeah, so so I'm in this situation, basically learning English, getting to know the culture. It was very difficult trying times. You know, we had a Catholic charity that took care of us, actually, initially when we came here, which is wonderful because they, uh, they were extremely helpful in teaching us English, uh, teaching us uh, how to write a resume, helping us find a job, and they did a tremendous job doing that, you know, for the, mm -hmm. for the refugees. You know, because, you know, on the papers when you're applying to immigrate to the United States, they ask you what religion you are. Not that we were practicing Catholics, really. But yeah. We were, I was baptized as a Roman Catholic, so was my dad, basically. So I didn't appreciate it so much then as I do now, basically, to see what the church really done, done for us. But anyway... <clears throat> 
so going through these uh, to, to, to basically establishing oneself in, in the country um, getting job you know learning English it wasn't until one day uh, later on like maybe I would say a couple of years later uh, we moved from South Southern California to North and uh, to the Bay Area in, in Northern California and we're driving on this road uh, and then there's like big sign archery shop <laughs> <laughs> And it kind of like sparked something. Okay? Yeah. So my, I said, Dad, pull over, pull over, you know. <laughs> my dad was driving. And so we go in there. And this was in the early 80s. So the compounds were just becoming prominent. Okay. So I saw the wall of compounds, right? And I'm looking for a bow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew they were bows, but it's like, yeah, this, they look weird, man. What is this? You know? <laughs> but in, one, in a corner there of the shop, there was a, there was a section of the traditional archery tech, right? Like, and it was mostly what he had there were uh, Martin Archery product, like ML10 longbow or the Howitt uh, recurve. I don't know if you're familiar with these it's from the old days, Martin Archery. And I went to that section. I'm still looking at it, and I just about asked the guy you know to hand me one of these bows over so i can look at it maybe try it out on a range they had an indoor range and but i said what do you want this for you know this this is old s-i-s-h-i-t you know don't you don't want that <laughs> like a carson yeah uh no you gotta get one of these modern things so my dad talked me into buying my first compound yeah okay and it was a martin lynx 25 percent let off you know today it's like today they have 85 percent so I brought that home and I started shooting and I got really bored and tired because after about a month I could shoot like lemons off of a lemon tree that we had in the yard mm-hmm. in the neighborhood. And I said, that's ah, not really archery, you know. So I, I went and I saved money and I secretly bought me a, a the longbow, the M10 <laughs> longbow. Kicked like a mule, dog on thing, <laughs> take your arm off. But I became, you know, it was a challenge, but I, I liked the challenge, mm-hmm. so. And that's how I started, okay? And and I went hunting, like, in Nevada with my buddy from work. And uh, uh, then one on that one particular hunt, I realized uh, how handicapped I, handicapped I felt with a compound bow because I had opportunities where I would just walk onto the buck in a bed. And it's like, and I startled him, and he would get up looking at me for, like, maybe three seconds. And, you know, before I actually went and looked through the peep side onto my pin side up front on a compound bow because it was an instinctive shooting mm-hmm. the damn thing was gone if i had a long bow i'd just you know he'd be dead he was from here to the door <laughs> and so i said no at that day i put that compound down now i'm not saying that there's not anything wrong with a compound yeah. bow okay if the guys love it great because i'd rather see guys shooting accurately instead of running around maiming animals because they don't know how to use traditional equipment yeah just kill the animal quickly exactly so <clears throat> So, but yeah, but to me, that's not really Archer. I call it training wheels. <laughs> and some somebody listening to it may get insulted by that. I apologize. No, no, I, no, I get it because like um, the range I uh, have a membership to, they want me to buy a compound bow because they see me with a horse bow and they like it. But it's like, no, you should buy a compound bow. Mm. So I, I shot one of the compound bows they had at it. Mm. I, I didn't like it because it was too easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it wasn't challenging. Yeah, I tried it like after a long time, uh, some some like a year ago. I, I, it was just felt felt so weird. I I don't know. There's something about it. It's 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 a tool. It's 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 a machine. It's mm-hmm. 40 moving parts, you know. And some of these like really top-notch compounds is just too complex. Anyway, back to that. So so and then I got married mm-hmm. the first time, <laughs> and I'm married second time now to my uh, present wife, mm-hmm. um, and um, I moved to Ohio. Yeah outside of Toledo in a small town of Grand Rapids and we had a farm there because my my wife then was established fairly well in uh, glass uh, blowing um, circles like as an artist basically independent and um, I studied with a man named Labino who was like the Dominic Labino was like the uh, sort of the godfather of the modern art glass movement in America mm. so she studied with him and she kind of inherited his studio and, and the property. So that's what I came into. And uh, that's at the time I was still making glasses. I was making a living. Glass sculpture, okay? Not not some knickknacks that you see over there, <laughs> St. Augustine. <laughs> yeah. Cell, no. It was like, you know, I was published. I was um, 
part of shows uh, in Chicago, you know, in places like that, in art galleries and and even internationally. So it wasn't like I was a complete unknown. And I did a lot of corporate stuff, commissions and stuff. But that archery was there. That little flame was still in there, right? And and as the time went on, I don't know. I got disenchanted with the modern art world. I always felt like when I did a sculpture, I was like selling my own kids. You know, how do you sell your own kids? You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I saw there were so many, you know, bullshitters out there. If I have to say it this way, I don't know if it's okay to say. No, that. you can curse. No, it's like no, I'm not gonna curse like really badly. Yeah. But this is the good word to put it, right? Yeah, it's like a, what in we modern talk- art, you know, this conceptual art. Somebody piles the sand in the middle of the room, and they they write ten pages about it, what it means, and then you're supposed to like swallow it up, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, it's like what we talked about earlier about the banana on the wall. Yeah, yeah, that exactly. happened a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, and somebody <laughs> pays fifty thousand for it. I mean, you know, no, no, I think it was in the millions. Yeah, what? Well, okay, it's crazy. This is what I'm. That's a complete insanity. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I had to. This is what I was fighting against. And the politics of it, you know. And I said, enough of it. I can't, I can't fool anybody with a bad bow, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that's I because already at that time I got the my I got the hands on this book of Jim Ham. He was one of the pioneers of the of the traditional archery, the, the going back to the Indians. You know, his guy from Texas. I, I'm I'm sure he's still alive. He wasn't that old. <laughs> and he he wrote this little book on Native American bows. You know, I'm sure you can still probably look it up someplace. And I studied it. I read it 10 times over. And I cut the wood down in the woods. We had 80 acres. So, you know, there was plenty of woods on the property. And um, then I had to wait to season it, you know. And it's like impatience. You got to season the bow? Oh, you got to season the wood before you can make the... What do you... You can't, you can't, you know, you cut it green, the wood. You cut it at a certain time of the year. uh And then you have to season it. What do you mean by season it? Season it, you have to air dry it. Oh, okay. It has to sit air drying basically oh. until the moisture basically Please. dissipates from the wood. So it's not a 30% content moisture content, but rather down to 10, 12% is mm-hmm. when you can actually make a bow out of it. Okay. Otherwise, if it's green, it's, you, you're going to string it and you're going to shoot and it's going to stay bent. Mm-hmm. It'll take okay. set, what's called a set. And so, you know, that's how I started just as a hobby, just tinkering around. Of course, pile of broken kindling and stuff <laughs> was usable for our wood stove. <laughs> so and then I got to know a uh, Dean Torgus um, from Southern Ohio, Ostrander, Ohio, outside of Columbus. Um, this man was became like the um, figure in, um, in traditional hunting and um, uh, self bow making. Okay. Uh, he was uh, he was a professor, I think, a uh, literature professor. He gave that up. He became a cabinet maker, and so that he he really was a great craftsman. That that was to his credit because it, the bow that he made when I first time I met him, they were beautiful self bows uh, made out of Osage orange or other white woods, not just Osage, like oak and even in um, ash and other other um, uh, woods. And so we became friends, and I kind of learned from him a lot. Okay, so that's and so my primary focus was the plains bows, the the, the Sioux, Cheyenne, Arapaho, and all that, Comanche, Kiowa. I still have a whole bunch of them in the <laughs> shop, and so I reproduced a lot of those. <clears throat> and then I realized, well, you know, I grew up in Czechoslovakia, so. It was formerly known as Bohemia, it was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire since the uh, Austrian Habsburgs, they took over in the um, early 1500s, really. Uh, after the political turmoil, after the Hussite uprisings in early 1400s, there was a lot of political turmoil, and so the Roman Empire, uh, the Habsburgs, they took advantage of that, the Austrian Empire, they took over Bohemia. We've been under them for 300 years, basically, until 1918, end of the World War One. When became independent again. Well, mm-hmm. Never mind. <laughs> but I always, you know, the stories floating around about the Turks, because the Turks invaded Europe many times, besieged yeah. Vienna several times, and you always heard about these powerful Turkish bows that they could penetrate, you know, oak door, you know, and stuff like that. So it really intrigued me, and I started looking into that. Mm-hmm. 
So I remembered as a kid, you know, hearing these stories or even like fairy tales about the boyars, Russian boyars with their recurved bows, you know, because the Russian boyars, they were influenced by the Mongols, obviously, yeah. who always, in, you know, in, controlled most of the Russia, really, uh, later on known as Tatars or the Tatar Ilkhanat in, uh, of Crimea. And uh, so, you know, I'd like to reproduce those, but the information was completely lost. We, we didn't know, you know, how it was made. It was the literature on it, you know. I didn't know a thing about it. I mean, I saw a few pictures from the museums. It was before the Internet. And I, uh, there was this one guy I met in one of these shows, these archery shows up in Michigan that were quite famous and large. And he says, yeah, I know one guy He's from Wisconsin. His name is Jeff Schmidt. He's a professor of physics and mathematics at the University of Wisconsin. And I, I just when I get home, I'll, I'll call you and I'll give you his phone number. I don't have it with me. So he called me back, sure enough. And so I contacted this man and spent like an hour and a half on the phone with him, picking his brain. He was gracious enough to listen to me, to talk to me. Um, I ended up going over there a couple of times because he was the first man I knew who actually recreated something like this successfully. Because mm -hmm. as you know, uh, beautiful things take generations to develop and it takes only one generation to lose it that skill mm -hmm. and because the way it was set up these guilds back in a day like in turkey for yeah. example you know each family guard their own secrets although sultan actually commissioned kani in 1800s to write a treatise or a book on the subject of uh, archery and flight ar archery and, and, and uh, especially on that subject but however he was not a bow maker nor was he a uh, archer yeah so a lot of the information written down and then later on translated from the uh, Ottoman language into German. It was originally translated to German first. Uh, there's a lot of like discrepancies, like what does this mean, you know. So we really, so that was the first book. So the collapse that guy in, in Chicago had it translated into English. So this was the first book. I think the first print was in 19, late 30s, 1930s. In fact, I have one of the originals from the World War II. The oh, book. wow. Yeah. You couldn't find it anywhere. Um, anyway, so that was the first book I read on the subject. But like I said, because it wasn't complete information, a lot of it was probably something that he described, but he didn't really understand. So Jeff actually cleared up a lot of it because he already had the trial and error experience. Okay. So... <clears throat> That's how I started. I was still making the art, art, the, the the glass. I was still making a living doing that. It was the primary way of doing it. But my my ex, you know, she saw what was happening in me. You know, that my heart was no longer in this <laughs> this art thing. And she said, "You should just quit. You know, just start making these bows." So, thanks to her, because she still had a business going that brought money, and I was able to go on my own because there was no money. Being a bow maker, there's no money in it. Yeah. Uh, that's the problem. So, to, so you have to build a niche for yourself. And it can take years before you have any reputation. You know, I no longer have to advertise or anything like that at all. I mean, I get orders from all over the world. Okay. So, uh, but initially that wasn't the case, obviously. So there was a little, but I it was, it was a little better for me because of these hornbows. Mm -hmm. As I started studying the how the hornbow functions, and as I started to gain a little bit, a little bit of experience making these bows, I started to understand the principles of the working limb in a hornbow that was unknown in a Western recurve, for example. Western recurve at the time, or even today, not so much today anymore because they're trying, they're starting to understand this principle as well, was basically a tapered limb. And so you bend, bend, bend until it gets broken. It's a tapered limb. Yeah. It's like basically, like a longbow is a tapered limb. You mm -hmm. know, it's a D-shaped longbow. That's basically from thick to thin, right? So it bends in an even arc. Well, yeah. That was the recurve, except it was curved. Okay. It wasn't until later they started using reversed uh, laminations and stuff. Um, so I started to duplicate these bows in modern materials. Okay, meaning that... Uh, I would make the static tip recurves, but to make them look like hornbows. Yeah. Okay. And apply my knowledge from building hornbows into these bows. And when people saw the performance, the efficiency, I immediately became known because of it. So it totally set me apart like very quickly. 
and that's how my career in bowl making started. So it didn't really take that long. So I, got, I had that niche. I developed that niche. So everybody knows me because of this, you know. And so this is like, wasn't until years later, I came into China for the first time to some competition. And mm-hmm. I had people like kissing my feet and calling me master. And like, <laughs> what the heck is <laughs> going on master. here? How did I get, I had no idea that all of a sudden <laughs> I was considered like to be one of the best bow makers in the world. And uh, I, I never knew how I got that uh, reputation, you oh. know. And so it was kind of amazing to see that I basically influenced the modern, what you see having your bow and everything is what I had invented, basically. Yeah. Okay. The principles of it. Okay. Of course, I don't get the credit for it so much anymore, <laughs> but that's okay. I, I know where it came from, and that's good enough for me. You know, you brought it back. <laughs> exactly. So not that I invented anything per se. But you brought it back into the modern but world. I was inspired by the knowledge of making these horn bows mm-hmm. and kind of translated into the modern bow making. And so uh, it was myself and primarily also another friend of mine up here in Georgia. His name is Yapko Pedreyer. He lives up in um, Odin or whatever the name of it is. Not, not too far when you get over the border into Georgia there. Um, so that, that, was, that, that was how I... That was how I got back into the archery, and and I guess the the rest is history because I started to officially do business. I had a partner, uh, Tony Horvath was his name, uh, from Michigan, right over the line. It's not too far from, you know, I didn't live too far from Michigan line. He was working for the Ford company as an engineer at the time. Very talented man. Uh, We became really good friends, and we kind of did it together to get it off the ground. Obviously there was not enough money for him to feed his family from this so he, he we, we didn't have like a bad party or anything he just says look i can't do this because you know there's just no way i mean mm-hmm. between my work and this so we kind of parted company we're still friends it's a great guy very excellent artist too painter and um so to, I, i've been in it ever since just alone i try to have people work for me but it's very difficult to find honest people i i have to be honest to say it this way it's difficult to find today people there is no longer that sense of apprenticeship that we used to have a couple hundred years ago. You know, um, you teach somebody and they run away with it, and then they uh, uh, say they came up with it. And they don't give you credit, or worse yet, they steal from you your knowledge and your ideas in other ways, or use something that you didn't allow. Them. So I mean, so that's one of the reasons I never really made the business big. I keep it exclusive. I'll never become rich, obviously, but that's okay because, um, you know, I could have done that 10 times over to hire people and work. Yeah. I'd, I'd become a manager then. I wouldn't have any creativity, time for creative, creativity, I should say. So um, so basically that's kind of the, the history of it. Back in 1997, 98, around that time is, is when I kind of, we went in officially into the business, first with Tony, and then a couple of years later it was just me. So and I've been doing it ever since. So, yeah. Yeah. So, how did you get into the competition part? How, because you actually have a range here on your property. But yeah. How did I get into com- competing? Well, and just to specify, he does actually horse mounted competitions mm-hmm. where he actually rides on a horse mm-hmm. and shoots from the back. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. It's um, okay. So, let me, let me put it. Okay. So, when I got married, I got married in 1989. Mm hmm. Two years after I, I was born. Yeah, I, I moved to Ohio. Now, I loved, the, as I said, I, mm. since I was a child, I loved horses. For me, this animal is magical. Just seeing it move, and it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible just to watch it. So as, as a kid, I was dreaming, you know, riding horses and stuff. But it was impossible to own a horse in Czechoslovakia. It was communist. It was a bourgeois thing. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, but then again... If you remember of the party high up, we call them red aristocracy, you know. That's the problem with the left. They talk about equality, equality, but in the end they become the one in, the ones in power. And that's who we call the red aristocracy. And you've got the class below them that's the same way off. <laughs> it's just oh, you know, all God. miserable <laughs> wretches, you know, uh, being ruled by these people. But anyway, so... It was impossible. I mean, it was kind of like just a dream. So it wasn't until I actually came here that I could realize these things. Mm-hmm. And it was the beautiful thing about America, you know, that 
at least back in the 80s, and it's still possible today, I'm sure, that it gave this, these opportunities that you wouldn't have anywhere else in the world. Yeah, there are many things that are wrong in, the, in this country, but at the same time, I couldn't say anything bad because if you work hard, if you're honest enough, you can get ahead. That's not, that's, you cannot say the same thing about other places in the world, you know. It's either due to bureaucracy that's too extensive. I mean, I know because my wife and I looked at, into certain things like how to do business. Even my former Czechoslovakia, you know, which is now free, basically, mm -hmm. or in Portugal and even Brazil. And it's like when you look into like the sticks they will throw at your feet as a small business person, it's difficult to get off the ground, unless you're a large corporation yeah. with a lot of money. It's like, forget it. It's getting harder and harder in this world. Uh, to live your dream people are becoming robots basically you know like working in places that are hating their jobs you know they cannot really realize their dream i'm extremely lucky because i'm able to make a living living in this surroundings being my own boss i'm, I'm you know i'm the lord of my time so i feel extremely fortunate you know being able to do that now i got a little sidetracked here what were we talking about uh, come back to we we're talking about how you got into horseback yeah poetry. that's it okay no but it's, so also I, coming back what you just said um no I, I get what you mean too i fortunately i work now i would love to do this for a living actually go around the world and actually mm -hmm. get people's stories mm -hmm. but right now i have to work a normal job yeah. <laughs> but but that's kind of like an american dream like yeah you may you, you want to sacrifice now to get to the place where you want to be been there done that and you're absolutely right because when i was younger when i was in my 20s it was for me that was coming back from work, my full-time job, mm -hmm. grabbing a dinner, taking a nap, and spending time working in my garage after I bought some equipment one by one for mm -hmm. cutting glass and stuff like that until two, three in the morning. Sleeping three, four hours. You know, I couldn't do that today. Do it while you can when you're young. I'm <laughs> telling you, this doesn't get any easier. Okay. So this, you have the right idea. You, you, you got to, you know, if if you got a dream. You know, as the saying goes, uh, if your heart is in it, money will follow. And money is not everything either. I mean, you know, of course you want to make a living. You know, yeah, of course you want the resources to keep yeah, going. Exactly. So, but I think that if, if, you, if you're passionate about something and if you have the vision that I think you can get there, I'm the proof of it. Mm -hmm. I had the vision and I went after it. And I, I think that a lot of people today, especially young people, lack that vision. They, they think it's not there. They, they think that... Uh, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but at least from what I see and what I see on the news and how things are and the rates of suicide going up, drug abuse and this and that, I think there's a lot of hopelessness. I, I, I agree with you. There's, because coming from my generation, it's like you kind of told, um, you kind of told that, you know, maybe it's best to be rich, that maybe you should just get a good you know, CEO jobs, something yeah, like yeah. that. And now, as I got older and the different careers I had, I was a police officer, I worked for Disney, yeah. now I work for, uh, yeah. for Tesla. Um, you know, it opens your eyes up. It's like, you no, know, this... Uh, Joseph Campbell, who's a guy that I love to quote, um, he studied mythology and mm -hmm. he came up with the idea of the monomyth. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that you should always follow your bliss. And sometimes that may take a while to find. Yeah. But... Bliss doesn't mean like it's going to be complete happiness. Like you want to suffer through it, but the bliss means that it's wor it's worthy to suffer through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, I, I I concur. Yeah. So anyway, first I had to get a horse, right? Yeah. Going back to the <laughs> archery, horseback archery part. Well, my ex grew up riding horses. She grew up in a well-to-do family, a local family up in Perrysburg, outside of Toledo which is the area of a lot of wealth in there because there was the Libby Owens Ford, the, 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 the spark plug, the, what is it, the champion spark plug, you know, that's the, the what is that, the family. And all these people. So she grew up in that environment, so she, she had access to horses and all this. So I don't know, I think, I think it was like in 1992, 93 when we got, 93 I think it was, when we got the first couple of horses we bought, a couple of Arabian horses. And I didn't know how to ride. I mean, I, so I was completely self-taught. I, I ruined one horse entirely, making it, making it hard mouth. Uh, the, the mayor, poor mayor was so afraid of me. Because as a man, you know, 
why, why do you think there are not many men riding horses anymore? It used to be totally men thing, mm -hmm. right? It's because men like to force their will on the animal. Yeah. Okay. And you cannot. Women are much more like, you know, they want to get involved and talk to the animal. And, you know, it's like, it's the, what's more the touchy-feely part of It's more of a relationship. So they get more success. Mm -hmm. Whereas men just, oh, you're going to do what I want you to do. It's just, and it's, so I heard, I learned the hard way. You, with horses, you have to be extremely impatient. And that in turn helped me to actually deal with people. Believe it or not, training horses helped me a lots of things. It was a long, painstaking process. But through that, I also became better with people, I dare to say. Okay? So that, you know, I went a few years going through a few horses, learning how to ride, doing all that stuff, still doing archery separate. And then when finally I was fairly proficient, even bareback riding and stuff, I put the two together. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't anything serious. It was just kind of like I would get on my horse bareback, pretending I'm an Indian, you know, <laughs> riding in my field outside of the house, you know, shooting at bales, you know, like it's pretending it's buffalo. I'm hunting <laughs> buffalo, you know, with the bows that I made, you know. It was great because I, you know, I killed a deer with a bow. My first deer I killed was my bow that I made. You know, it was a sinew back shine bow like this short. Oh. I came into the shop where you check the deer in the check station. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of compound bow hunters, you know, there, and they saw the deer that I got. Oh, that's a nice buck, man. What'd you get it with? And I showed them my bow. <laughs> what did you do? Beat it to death with that stick? <laughs> I says, no, the oh. arrow went right through the buck. I, didn't, I never found the arrow. And they're like, I never found the arrow. <laughs> they, they were staring at me like, you know, what, what planet did you come from? They couldn't believe it that it's I like, killed it. like, oh, your ancestors used this. Yeah, I gave it to a friend of mine uh, with the mound, uh, the first, my first buck, friend of mine in New York, who just has it hanging in this flat in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, with, the, with the bow that I killed it with. Um, yeah, it was amazing. So... That's how I started. Nothing serious, just fun. I never knew there were like even other people doing it, okay? Nobody was doing it, except one man in Hungary. Mm -hmm. His name is Lajos Kashai. Uh, you probably, if you, you'll find him on the internet if you just punch it in Lajos Kashai. He's kind of a godfather of the modern horseback archery. Now, I don't agree with him on many things, his philosophy mm -hmm. and approach to horseback archery. <laughs> but he was initially my inspiration, and I admired him greatly for what he has done for the sport. We had our differences later on, but uh, I probably still do today, obviously, because of the way we approach the sport a little differently. But uh, he's an amazing man with an amazing skill. You know, by far, in his sport and this, the type of a track that he practices, that he developed, He's he's unbeatable till today. Okay. I did beat him twice. Mm -hmm. One time in a serious competition. I'm the only one in, in the world who actually did. I, I, I'm going to brag because that's <laughs> you know, something to brag about. <laughs> and I beat him one time in semifinals. And the only reason I didn't go into the finals is because it was an Alfaris competition in Jordan. I had to leave. I had to come back home. Mm. Okay. There was some church function. I'm a Catholic, so mm. it was installation of a pastor, and he wanted me to altar serve for him. So I said, yeah, I'll be back. Because to me, that was more important than just running around on horses. But anyway, so that's, um, that's basically um, um, how I got into it, uh, is that he came to America. A, a, a friend of mine, at the time I didn't know him, but we became good friends. His name is David Gray. He's up in PA, outside of Pittsburgh. I think it's called Williamsburg or something. I forget the name of the town he lives in. Anyways, um, he went on, to, on a trip to Europe. And um, he was in Austria, and somehow he came across... Somebody or a shop where he saw one of these like like bows like you have, you mm -hmm. know, um, and and asked the guy, where did this come from? Oh, it's a man in Hungary making this, and I said, I'm not too far from Hungary. I have a rental car. He found out who he was, where he lived in Kaposmero, south of Budapest. There, uh, I, you know, got his phone number, called him up. Can I come? Sure, come on down. He spoke. Not very good English, but good enough. 
uh, Lajos at the time that uh, he managed to arrange for the meeting, so he went to his valley. And when he saw him doing it, he was so impressed that he thought about it. And it's like, how can we bring this guy into America and like have him put on a show at one of these big, big shoots that we have up north, like in Michigan. Yeah. That at the time, it was called Longbow Invitationals, you know. And so it wasn't just a 3D shoot and a competition, but also a lot of vendors, you know, mm -hmm. coming from all over the country to sell <laughs> their bows and stuff and arrows. And so he brought him in 1988, he brought him to America. At, to Berrien Springs in Michigan and I was there with Tony the partner I mentioned initially the, the, the man that I did the bows with we had a booth set up there and uh, you know so uh, I was so excited because I knew that you know this was coming in you know that, they, that we were waiting for them to, to drive in from Pennsylvania and they, they came in they settled they got the horses taken care of and everything they built a course the next morning the track, you know, mm -hmm. I know Lyos had like a few days only with the, the getting a good horse because not every horse is going to take up horseback archery. Yeah. It's like people have different talents for different things uh, or abilities, physical abilities of a sort. You know, not, not everybody's going to be a power lifter or not everybody's going to be a, you know, runner or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, so you, the same with the horses, they have different talents for different things. But anyway, he got this horse trained. And then I saw it and I saw, my gosh, this is incredible. It's like watching a ballet on a horse. This guy's so good, you know, shooting six arrows on a run, a 90 meter track, making it look so effortless, you know, and uh, I got really intrigued. So we became friends. We, I talked to him and David, we, when we sat down with Yapko Pedrai, the guy that I mentioned in Georgia here and his wife, and he says, we should do like a festival, archery festival, and bring this guy over. Maybe we can like have him teach this skill, you know, to us. And they found a place out in Iowa, in the middle of cornfields, Fort Dodge, Iowa. But yeah, it was tucked away in the middle of nowhere, but at least the local community was like willing to put up some money, give us the fairgrounds. We got some sponsors. There was a, a lady there, a teacher, a local teacher, who was really good at writing grants, you know, and um, asking for money. So that's where we started. And um, I was kind of like his right-hand man uh, because I was probably the most skilled at the time to even like help him out since I was already practicing a little bit of that horseback archery. And so we became really good friends and I learned from him. He wasn't a very good teacher. It wasn't just because of his English, but uh, mm -hmm. he, he just wasn't a good teacher. I, you kind of had to learn from just watching. Yeah. I mean, the only thing he ever explained to me how to do was uh, how to do back shot, the parting shot or the Parthian shot. The back shot is when you actually put yeah, the bow yeah. behind your back. And... No, no, that's called the Armaki shot. Mm -hmm. uh, just basically shooting over the rump of the horse, just okay. the regular way. Okay. Right? Okay, so, you know, the, the seat, the position, how you shift your weight and all this stuff. And uh, so those those were the beginnings, and that's, that's how I slowly started to develop... Um, the skill we went over to his uh, valley <coughs> in uh, Hungary, in Kapos Mero, his, his incredible training facility mm -hmm. that he built. He was lucky because this was at the time when the communism was kind of like falling apart. Well, it really wasn't, wasn't falling apart. It got imported, I mean exported on different names into Western Europe. Um, but the things were changing in those former communist countries. It was becoming more free, at least economically speaking, you know, more capitalist-like. And so he was able to purchase the land. At the time, it was like a wild west. It was the same in my country. Okay, you could pick up a piece of land for nothing. It was like people's machinations that were half criminal, basically. You know, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a wild west. So he came in at the right moment. And uh, because of the cheap labor and everything, he developed... A, the building these bows and the, the labor was cheap and he could sell in the West. So there's money coming in left and right. So he built this incredible facility. Okay. He's got an indoor track covered. Okay. It's over a hundred meters long. Okay. To practice horseback archery, <laughs> you know, in inclement wet weather. And then he's got an outside course. He's got practice, uh, just ground archery courses. It's, 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 then he built this like very traditional, like a 
in a tradition of the old Magyars when they there was the last invasion to the Carpathian Basin. As you know, there were three successive ones from the Huns through Avars to Magyars. And uh, they built a kind of a style of that, uh, of that architecture. I, it's not that they built something, like, but it's that, it's that particular style, this old Magyar, because Hungarian is actually... It's called Magyar, okay. okay, which which is the name of the tribe that came in there, mm-hmm. okay, Magyar, okay, Magyar, 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 yeah. It's not. It's Hungary is. Uh, I don't know where that came from. It's an English word for it, uh, Ungarish in in uh, German, but the, the that's actually Magyar. And so, it, so I went there with four other guys, Pat Stoddard. Alex Tiberi and Todd Dell. Those were the four of us. There was another kid, unfortunately, who was very talented, but he quit. I, whatever happened to him? You know, you got these people that shoot up like stars, <laughs> light up really bright, and then they just kind of peter out. Yeah. And so, so that's that was the that was the beginning of the horseback archery. So I came back and we had some issues. We had a kind of like uh, we drifted apart eventually three years later on over certain issues that I don't want to go into. <coughs> That's besides the point. Mm-hmm. And um, I became the basically the head instructor in America to do this, to continue it, when yeah. he stopped coming here mm-hmm. after him. And um, and we found it with David Gray, we found it, the organization called MA3, mm-hmm. Which is basically the kind of to unite the people and put them under one banner, and uh, that it's in existence still today. I led it for many years, but you know, obviously eventually I got tired of it, so it's, I'm no longer involved with it. I'm a life member, but uh, I'm not involved in the politics of it anymore, yeah. and the leadership of it. And so, yeah, and so here we are today, uh, years later, 20, 21, 22 years later, 20. If I count up going or starting horseback, I'm 97. So I, I just wish I started earlier. <laughs> you know, I, I'm 58, and something told me this year that, you know, how you get this like intuition of some sort, something like like a little bug that gets in yeah. your head and says, you know, it's time to quit. You know, it's like you know. <laughs> It's not that I wanted to. It was really sad for me to sell my horses. I still have one horse left. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I go out there just for my own kicks. <coughs> but this happened very quickly. This just happened recently. Okay, I, I sold him like, what, four weeks ago? Oh. But I kind of knew that this period in my life is over. And, and I've been always the kind of a guy that if I do something, I just don't beat around the bushes. If I quit, okay, I'm quitting. That's mm-hmm. it, you know. I'm not quitting archery, obviously. I still want to compete in ground archery yeah. because I don't have to worry about falling off and breaking something because mm. that's another thing. I don't bounce as well as I used to. And <laughs> if you're riding horses, you're going to fall off. Yeah. And going to these competitions, I've been on some crazy animals. Okay. And it's, it get, can get dangerous. Nobody's ever got really badly hurt in this sport. Mm-hmm. Mm, this last year guy in Hungary got, got pretty mangled, but... Uh, I had fall, I had pretty hard falls, and I got to knock it. Thanks to God, that I had never really seriously got hurt. Oh, you know, I I would get banged up and be sore for a few days, right? But now it's not few days anymore. It's a week or two or a whole month that I'm sore if I fall. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. As you kind of like go over 45 mark, you know, it's just like you don't recover as well if you go work out. You don't, uh, you know, it's just things just not, it's not the same. So I have to live in reality. I have to use good counsel and I have to be prudent. And since I'm the only one who makes money, my, my wife helps me in a business, but, you know, um, if I don't work in that shop, no money's coming in. Yeah, so you can't afford to get hurt. Exactly. So uh, that's why I kind of like, okay, time to leave. And it's better to leave while you're at the top. The last competition, I won. Yeah. And I beat somebody I wanted to beat really badly <laughs> to put him in his place, okay, because he really deserved it. Uh-huh. So... I achieved what I achieved. I'm, I'm the only one who ever beat Kasai once, and I'm proud of that. 
nobody else was able to ever beat him. I'm the only one who ever beat him. So I accomplished all these things. I, I, I won so many medals and so many things and competitions. And if I didn't place first, I would be second or third. I'm trying to brag. I'm just telling you, yeah, I'm proud of that accomplishment. Why not? You know, I, d I did pretty damn good for myself. So I, I don't need to prove anything anymore. You know, I used to have a really big ego. I do admit to that. <laughs> But I've kind of wised up since I no longer have the dog in this hunt. So I just coach, do a lot of coaching now. I get hired and people, uh, I go teach people archery and uh, ground archery or horseback archery, you know. And uh, yeah, because I saw on, on your website you still teach yeah, classes. Yeah, I have people come here for private lessons. <laughs> So, in fact, I'm going to have somebody come in, like, and they bring their own horses. This horse that I have is, is got a kind of a screwy head. Mm -hmm. He's very good, does horseback archery well, but once in a while, something take, clicks in there, and the, the screw gets loose, and he does stupid things, and can fall off and get hurt. And <laughs> Oops, I can't put anybody on him. So, um, okay, so that's that. Um, that's the history of it just about brought up to date yeah. all right guys so we're going to go to our other half of the interview um so for anyone that's new to the interview or for anyone that's uh, returning listeners thank you guys for returning uh for anyone new to the interview i um ask these specific questions towards the end of the interview uh these questions are more like psychological questions they're some of them are fun some of them are serious but they're both they're supposed to show a different side of a person. Uh, the reason why I ask these questions is be it's because I interview a lot of people that come from different paths of life, got different points of view, and these questions are supposed to show a different side to that person, and it's supposed to show empathy too. So the reason for these questions is I want people to connect to the people I'm talking to. So we get started. Given the choice of anyone in the world from any time period, who would you want as a dinner guest and why? Say that again. Phrase it again. So if yeah. you if you had to choose anyone from any time period, or from any part of the world, from history, mm -hmm. from present to the past, who would you want as a dinner guest and why? Who would I want as a dinner guest? That's a really interesting question. And uh, I don't know if you will guess the answer or not. Genghis Khan? No, actually no. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what means more to me than anything. I'm a Catholic, I already uh -huh. told you, and a very orthodox one. I would say it would be Jesus Christ. Yeah. But the thing is that I can have him as a meal in, in his body, blood, soul, and divinity in a mass. Yeah. So if I think about it in those terms, then I would then go back and say, if it was just a regular human being, whom would I have for a dinner guest would be Fernando III, King of Castile and Leon, mm -hmm. Saint Fernando III. I just read his uh, biography. This is incredible. I never heard of him. Uh, it's just unbelievable if you read this man's oh, life. Well, what's, what's special to Well, he conquered you? basically uh, most of the peninsula in 1200s, mm -hmm. okay? The final conquest didn't happen until um, um, the Ferdinand of Cas uh, Cas uh, not Castile, of uh, Aragon and, and uh, Isabella of Castile. Uh, the combined forces, they, they basically pushed the final Moors out, out of the Sp Spanish... Uh, I'm out of the peninsula there, but he managed to almost entirely conquer the whole peninsula uh, by by himself um, in the, the the mid 1200s, basically, the reconquest of the uh, of the of Spain and uh, and how he did it and his life. And his devotion, uh, he was a very religious man. Well, he was a, he was a living saint, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just, it was more, it's, it's more than miraculous what he was able to accomplish. So, uh, as a person, as a king, he was a very compassionate king, very just king. He wasn't just some, you know, despot, you know, anything <laughs> like that. 
yeah, I mean, I just recently read his book, and I've never read anything like it. Yeah, his his contemporary was a, a Saint Louis the Ninth of France. It was another crusading king. A lot of people probably hear this and say, "Oh, the Crusades." The Crusades. <laughs> you know, people don't know anything about history mm -hmm. and the reality of it. Okay, uh, what actually Crusades were and what happened at that time. And I don't know if you want to get into it. No, that's. But but that's there's a lot of misinterpretation, misconception, and outright lies about the history of the Crusades. Uh -huh. and the, it was not that the Europeans set out to conquer the territory and kill the Muslims. That mm -hmm. wasn't the objective. The objective was to protect a lot of the Christians in the area. You have to realize that that area was actually Christian before the Muslim came. Yeah, you know, solidly Christian. And it was uh, until the uh, the rise of Islam that the Islam actually they came in and and, uh, and conquered the area, did a lot of damage to the local populace and to the Christian faith. And um, yes, there were things done wrong on both sides, but that's war. And, and if you look at it from the perspective of the time period, it wasn't anything worse that they would have done then that we do now in some of these wars. And so. Um, so it was, it was a just war of self-defense, basically. Some of these crusades, eh, not necessarily were they always... There were some people that were motivated by gain, yeah. of course, by material gain. But a lot of it was really, truly spiritual. Mm -hmm. Okay, And, uh, you know, they always say, oh, the, the, the Muslims, you know, they... Uh, they look, they, they came into the Middle East, they conquered the area, they adopted a lot of the local uh, customs. The trade went on just fine. There, there might have been a battle over the hill, mm -hmm. but the people went on about business. The Christians and Muslims trading and living together just fine. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the way it's portrayed today is this, this, this war of aggression, these horrible Christians. Everybody likes to hate on the church, mm -hmm. but nobody says one thing. We wouldn't have the Western culture if it wasn't for church. We wouldn't have the compassion for each other that we have today, because that's a Christian uh, virtue. The, the church started uh, hospitals, universities, we wouldn't have the education. If it wasn't for the Benedictine monks, we wouldn't have the Europe that you know today. We wouldn't have America that you know today. And that's what people are blind to recognize. But devil seems to hate the church, the true church, which I believe is the Catholic church, if I have to get into the religion of it. Mm -hmm. but. That's the sad reality of it. And of course, Islam has its good points. You know, they've, they've done lots of good things um, in science, art, and all this stuff. Especially math. Yeah, math, yeah, astronomy, mm -hmm. you know, all this. And so even Fernando III, when he was conquering the pencil, he always gave an offer to, and Genghis Khan did the same thing, in fact. Look, if you surrender to me, you're just going to be my vassal. You can stay a king. You have to pay me a tribute. But I'm not going to screw with your culture. Yeah, he kept the cultures. Yeah, you kept the, but you cannot abuse the Christians. You're going to have to learn to live in peace. And it was the same thing with Genghis Khan. In fact, it was, in, the, the, he had laws against intolerance. Mm -hmm. You had to get along, Muslims, Christians, and everybody in, in his kingdom. Now, I'm not saying he was promoting what, what we call indifferentism, which is like any religion, just, just as good as any other. Well, that's not true, but nonetheless, look, if you believe in something, the other person may not agree with you, but whether you like it or not, you're gonna to have to tolerate it somehow. He's your, this is this is your neighbor. So yeah, you this is your neighbor. Them. You know, love your neighbor, and that's one of the Christian principles. Love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love your neighbor because he loves you. No, it also goes on and says love your enemy. Okay, mm -hmm. that means you wish the best for them, and so people tend to forget their roots of the Western civilization, and so. It's always a complex issue, and it's really a touchy issue, especially today when you have so much political correctness. You know, like when I see like being statues pulled down uh, because generally represented the southern, you know, the, the slavery and all mm -hmm. this stuff. Well, okay, it's a history. What are you gonna do about it? I mean, okay, it happened. Get uh, over it. My thing is like, if there's not a reason to pull the statue down, and yeah, my thing is like. Yeah, I get if like there's a statue that's celebrating um, a general that did mass genocide or well, he didn't do mass genocide. Well, I'm just saying as an example, but like 
I don't think they should be torn down. I think like, okay, let's put we put in a proper context. Right. Historical exactly. Context. One to teach the history properly, but reminds us of the because past. Because yeah, because you don't want to forget what happened. Okay, fine. If we're gonna have a statue of Hitler, or st- you know, well, or Stalin for that matter, mm-hmm. he's actually worse than Hitler. Yeah, Nobody he, talks about him anymore. Because he killed or, more. He, of he killed he more did. people, right? He, my grandpa used to say that <coughs> Hitler was a nobody. He said, hey, Hitler's nobody. This is like, it's a pupil of Stalin. I mean, the, Sta- the Stalin was a real animal. Mm-hmm. It, it, the Stalin, not only did he have more time to kill more people, okay? It, it's, ah, oh, let's not even go there. I, I grew up in the system. I grew up talking to the people that remember the bad times, went through the war, who were on the front in Russia, were the Germans. Uh, the, I talked to Wehrmacht Germans. I knew one SS man who survived the Gulag, extremely rare, who worked for my father. You said he was an SS man? He was an SS man when he was young. He joined when he was about 16, 17. Mm-hmm. You know, the history gets so skewed and oftentimes when you hear it actually out of the mouth of people who were part of that history, who were actually at the forefront of it, oftentimes you get a slightly different perception of how things really were. We're not in, told entirely the truth. We, we're, we're told things that, in a sense, that how, what they want us to believe now, that suits their political motives. We're always being manipulative, manipulated. Mm-hmm. as people and that's why it's so important that you have to educate yourself and because people most of the time are, are either lazy to get educated on their own because the schools not give you the okay they can teach you math whatever but when it comes to history and politics you have to educate yourself you have to know the history and what is what is history is today's politics you know people just take the news prepackaged like the cereal <laughs> And believe everything they 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 they, they see on the on the news. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, sometimes a regular family, American family, or any other family in the Western world. I'm not talking. I'm not making comments about other parts of the world. It's you know, they have to worry about paying their bills, taking care of the children if they have any and stuff like that. So it's a little different story. They may not have time so much to, you know, muddle through the confusion. Okay. There's other priorities. Yeah, exactly. So, but in the end, in today's world and the confusion that we have, you do have to educate yourself because nobody else is going to do it for you. Yeah, I always believe you should, you need to find the truth out for yourself. Exactly. You got to talk to people, get different opinions. Mm-hmm. And you kind of have to read between the lines and oftentimes. And go to credible sources. You have to become objective. You have to be extremely patient. Uh, to listen to people instead of coming to quick conclusions. It, sometimes it takes take it takes time to figure out what's going on in a particular area of politics, history, whatever, uh, to current affairs. Um, yeah, it's um, it, that's you know that that's what that's what people need to do. I I, I just I, I you know the problem is that the schools, especially today, the schools are becoming sort of the centers of indoctrination. Not every public school is like that. There's some really good public schools, but there are some public schools in very liberal areas. I, I'm obviously, you can discern I'm a more of a conservative mm-hmm. person. That's because I grew up under the communism, and I know exactly how it works. And so they can't fool me. And most people, most liberals today are the leftists, whatnot. There mm-hmm. might be well-meaning, but it's kind of a naive perception how the world works. Okay? And so... But some of it is really cunning and actually on on the side of evil. Communism rejects entirely. It's totally materialistic. Mm -hmm. Rejects the existence of God. God is the government. Government's going to take care of you. Organization. What they don't understand is that when they get the power, it's read 1984. Oh yeah, that's that's what happens. Yeah, one one day I tell people. And these people that are promoting these ideas, especially young people today, Mm -hmm. your generation and younger. I, I call these people useful idiots because they may be well-meaning, but they're being used without even knowing it. Because once once those that are really in power in charge of this, once they grab the power are, and are in power, they will dispatch these people. They will get rid of them. And all of a sudden, you'll have a wake-up call and say, what did I do? How come I helped this to get into, the, you know, into power and establish the system? You've got... I don't know what's the percentage of young people today between 20 and 30 who believe that socialism is something wonderful. 
Yeah. I'm not saying capitalism is. It, it's not fair capitalism today either, especially the way it's set up. Yeah, the way that originally, because I was talking to one of my good friends about this. Originally, capitalism set up for this country was supposed to be for small, medium businesses. Exactly, but this is now it's a, it's a big big corporations. I don't get a break. Nobody makes anything easier for me. Mm-hmm. You understand? It's it's it, this is becoming like it's 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 um uh, it's called a um. It's the big corporations, they get into cahoots with the government. Basically. Oligarchy. Oligarchy, and, and it's like this uh, welfare for the for the corporations, and everything is in their favor. Mm-hmm. And they become bigger and bigger and bigger, swallow up the small business, and they basically dominate the market. And it's not only through that, but also through usury, okay, meaning uh, banking, okay, you, the, you know, these uh, compound interests and people living... They entice you with buying things and getting into debt because you can't afford it because you want these things. And that's just the nature of a man to want things, I suppose. You know, the passions take over. Yeah. And so I got to have this you yeah, know, because it's going to make me happy. And then once you get that, you're going to have to do another thing. But I, you really can't afford it. So this system gives you perception of, well, yeah, but the money's so easy to get. All I have to do is go to the bank. You know, and if I pay every month, you know, I'm going to get that loan. And then before you know it, you're in debt up to your ears. And you can get out of it. And so, so many people, one of the reasons we had this last the debacle, uh, this crisis, uh, is because people couldn't afford the houses that they had. And so it just tanked. And we had to all bail them out. We had to bail out the banks. Mm-hmm. So this kind of capitalism sucks. Okay, church is an answer for this. It's called distributism. It's a kind of a, a just system that's not socialist, but it's not a capitalist either. Because you have the right to property, Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, and and a, and the church is teaching uh, you have right to business, right to make a living, but what is enough? You know, it's like so many people they just grow, grow. I mean, what's what's he up to now? Uh, uh, the, the Microsoft guy it was like eighty billion oh, ten um, years ago. It was Bill like, Gates. huh? Bill Gates. Yeah, Bill Gates. Uh, ten years ago it was like forty billion. Now he's like eighty billion. You know, it, it's like well, when is it enough? What? I think he's no. I think he's going the other way because he's been he's retired, but he's been donating his money. Henry I Warren know, Buffett. I know. Well, you can donate for. But the I think, he, like. but you're thinking about also to um, Jeff Bezos, the Amazon yeah, guy. Yeah. The the problem is, however, that oftentimes uh, these big businesses, because they're so big and they have so much power and influence, uh, generally their politics aren't necessarily the best either. So what they influence oftentimes because of uh, being so the huge and dominating it's like george soros is another person example mm-hmm. the man collapsed so many currencies and got rich off of it and supports all kinds of upheaval all over the world all these little revolutions because of his mentality and idea how to restructure the culture okay it's completely twisted and demonic actually this man and 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 everybody thinks oh he does such a wonderful work no he doesn't he's outlawed from russia he's outlawed from hungary okay uh, these, pe- the, these people don't want him there because, uh, like I said, he's destroyed countries and got rich off of it. Nobody knows the history of this man, who he is and how he got into the money. He got rich manipulating and collapsing currencies. Okay. Yeah. The, the man is completely evil. His society is open society. Sounds wonderful he promotes, you know, especially a lot of people who are liberal. But uh, it, that's the problem with some of this stuff, that it just sounds great as an idea. Communism mm-hmm. sounds great as an idea, socialism. Everybody's equal. First of all, there's no such thing as equality. There's always hierarchy in everything. Yeah. You, I mean, if you, you're an artist, you're going to have a domain. You have your well, own domain it's not it. even that. It's like you're not everybody going to be a professor. And somebody's going to have to dig the ditches, unless you have a robot to do it. Mm-hmm. And somebody has to teach at the universities. Not everybody can be president. Somebody uh, in the army, for example, and somebody's general, somebody is a soldier. Yeah. There's a hierarchy in everything. There's no equality in anything. We are equal to each other only in the sense that we're human beings and we have the same basic rights. Mm-hmm. Okay. To, to, to liberty, freedom, and, and this and that. Other than that, beyond that, there's no equality. So this sense of like equality on what level? Like income? Is that what you know? If you're good at something, you should be awarded for it. Yeah. Okay. You, you cannot pay the same amount of money to somebody who prunes trees and uh, and to somebody who who, who does something so incredibly uh, complex and uh, they, like brain surgery, for example. Yeah, sometimes it goes overboard, you know. But 
you know what I'm saying? It's it's just this this whole notion of equality that's that's just false, and it's been used as a sort of a pretense for bamboozling people into following their idea. Well, my, my thing about the equality thing, because uh, it kind of, how should I put this? There, there was a time in this country with the whole civil rights era, like mm -hmm. yeah, there were. Especially me, because I'm Hispanic. Mm -hmm. If I was living around that time, I wouldn't be treated like a normal, like a normal American. Yeah. And that's when equality, like okay, equality should become like hey, every American needs to be treated the same rights. I'm gonna touch up on that very quickly. Uh, the, we call it racism. Yeah. And uh, you know where that comes from? I'll tell you. Secularized Calvinism. Calvinism. Mm -hmm. As a heresy, back in the early 1500s, you got Martin Luther, Calvin, yeah. Zwigli, and all these guys. Mm -hmm. Calvinism believes of predestination, that God predestined people to be saved. Well, that's nonsense in the Catholic theology, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so people that were black or of color, they were obviously the ones, because they but back then it was like they all lived on these primitive villages and on some continent, dark continent, in Africa, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, they were the cursed ones because they never progressed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this Calvinism, this country is based on this kind of ideology. The first settlers, well, the, the first settlers actually were Catholics here, but they got pushed out by these Protestants that mm -hmm. came over. Now, I'm, I'm going to start a religious war here and somebody's going to really hate me for this. But this is the historical fact and the truth. Okay. So this mentality came into this country. So owning people was not against their basically senses, against their ideas, because these people are not even people. Oh, we can own blacks and put them on the on the plantation and have, have them work for us. Yeah. Okay. Because they're, they're almost less than humans. Because they're be considered beast. Yeah, exactly. Now, in a Catholic country like Brazil, for example, mm -hmm. where the slavery wasn't abolished until 1889 or something like that, much later than here even. Yeah. But the slavery was a different character. Now, Catholic Church never endorsed slavery, ever, okay? In some of these systems and countries, it was tolerated, mm -hmm. but the slavery was such that the slave had a right to do his own business in his free time. They mm -hmm. didn't have to work for his master all the time. Some of them, in fact, became quite rich and oftentimes bought their own freedom. Slaves had slaves working for them. I'm not saying owning people is, yeah. is, is a good idea or it's something it's terrible. Mm -hmm. But there are degrees of what slavery is. Nobody talks about it. and how the slavery actually functioned. In a world of like ancient Rome, mm -hmm. it was in fact people put themselves into slavery because they were so poor and impoverished, it was better to be a slave to work and live in a nice house with a good warm quarters and get uh, three square meals a day to mm -hmm. work for the master. Or if you had a lot of debt and you couldn't, you put yourself in a slavery to pay it off that yeah. way. So there were people that people got mistreated, killed, because you know, lynched and all this stuff. But actually, the slavery became really unbearable, especially in later times, in like America in 19th century. Okay, and it was because of this thinking. Okay, where people said, you know. These people are cursed, you know, because they never progressed. So they're they're destined for hell. You know, this was this Calvinistic <laughs> yeah. mentality that was actually uh, a Protestant in its origin. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of my Protestant brothers and sisters who believe in Christ as I do will probably curse me for saying this and will totally and absolutely disagree with me. But, um, for example, the massacres of the Indians. Uh, let me give you an example. Of the Trail of Tears. Trail of Tears of the, uh, yeah, and not just Cherokees, but even out west, like the, the, the Black Kettles Village it was completely wiped out and taunted as being an incredible victory for the American army. No, they only murdered women and children because the men are, were out on a hunt, okay? It was in the dead of the winter, and it was led by Chivington, who was a former Protestant preacher. Okay, so that only shows you who killed these people. Mm -hmm. In Florida, in St. Augustine, when they landed, Ponce de Leon, in 1565, they started missions. And it was what's called the Royal Road. Okay, they started missions from the St. Augustine going up north into Georgia and then going inland. Each mission built a school. Okay, the conversion was done, done forcefully. Mm -hmm. Okay, they started building hospitals, taking care of the people, doing school. The English came. Nobody talks about these atrocities. The Protestant English came. 
give you an option to the Indian that converted Catholicism. We either kill you or you convert to be a Protestant. Okay, they burned all the missions out. What the church had built, all these things that they'd done for the people here, okay, for the, for the Indians, who willingly then even converted. Okay, not, not under derision or, you know, at the point of the sword. These missions were burned down and destroyed. Okay, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people killed by the British, by the Protestants. Okay, so... Uh, and it was the same out west before anybody got to Lewis and Clark. The Jesuits were already out in Montana and, and, and Wyoming, and the same in Canada, you know, evangelizing people mm -hmm. and bringing light into the world of the darkness. Okay, because there is a lot of this demonic and shamanistic, you know, we kind of like tend to paint the culture of the Indians as mm, it's wonderful, but I've been on these reservations mm -hmm. and there is a spiritual undertone to it and it's extremely dark. Yeah, they want to worship the, the you know, the spirit in the sky and stuff so they have the notion of this one god but it's not just one god it's very pantheistic or it's they have you know they worship the spirits too and i've been part of the stuff in my younger days that would kind of give you heebie-jeebies as to what they do mm -hmm. okay so um the church really did brought some light into the world they did they did very good things and uh that is being ignored and um, the church is now attacked especially in light of the um um, the abuses, mm -hmm. sexual abuses, but what nobody says this that these abuses are actually, in fact, almost minuscule in comparison to what goes on in the Protestant communities, mm -hmm. Jewish communities, in high schools, karate coaches, or whatever. How much abuse there is of, of the uh, pedophilia and stuff. Uh, but nobody talks. Everybody goes after the Catholic Church. Oh. Now, I look. I'm not a friend of Pope. He's a holy mm -hmm. father. I respect the office. I don't like his politics. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's a good Pope, but he is my Pope. Okay. Um, but the church gets a lot of bad rap uh, that's not based on uh, any facts or truth or anything like that. Well, my, my take on that is because I was, I was raised Catholic. So what happened to you? Uh, where are you from originally, your family? Uh, Puerto Puerto Rican, but well, yeah, well, mainly, mainly totally from New York. Catholic, man. Yeah, but I was mainly, I was mainly, most of my, I think third generation from New York, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. third or fourth. Right. Um, no, it's just different viewpoints, and then um, it's, my mom was uh, overly religious, and it came to a point where I just saw her being hypocritical. Hmm. Yeah, well, that happens to anybody in any religion. Look, you cannot just religion or the church by the way the people behave. In it. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people leave the church because what they see people do mm -hmm. and, the, and, and being part of the... That's, I do find that in any organization. It doesn't even have to be a religious organization. And to judge, you have to know the teaching of the church. The mystical body of the church is one thing. The physical body of the church is another. We're all sinners. So to leave a church just on pretense of this, where you see the hypocrisy, is actually, no, you, you shouldn't do that. You should actually, to know how beautiful the teaching is, it's based on reason, okay? You've got centuries and centuries. It's the oldest governing organization in the world. Mm -hmm. And Christ promised that it would never die until he comes back again. I was a Protestant for 17 years, so I was a baptized Catholic mm -hmm. and couldn't find a fulfillment in my faith until I came back to the church. I would die for this church. I would die for this Pope even though that I don't like him. Okay? But I'm not a fanatic in the sense that I would go bash somebody's head in because they don't believe the same. Mm. Okay? Because it's a talent religion and it's a religion of love. Not many people follow it that same precept because they don't know their faith they say they're catholic but they're not in their action in their life they're not and that's what you see and that's why you say you know who wants to be part of this organization that's how people judge uh, uh, the church and that's why they leave it and it's also because the church failed in the last 50 years since the council the last vatican council too they failed in teaching the the laity you know, how to be a good Catholic. 
and to follow Christ's uh, Christ teaching. You know, so um, that's basically it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we're reaping the this becoming complete apostasy. And one of the reasons that, that we're in shambles and Europe is in shambles because they threw God out the window. Anything goes. They think the freedom is that your liberty is that you can do whatever you want. I mean, look look at today's like the sexual confusion about sexuality and all this transgender. People want to be the, the, uh, called by their proper pronouns, whatever, uh, yes. whatever that means. Yeah, I don't like that. No, it, there's only two sexes. I don't care how you look at it. Mm. Yeah, scientific. It, is this? The, yeah, it's it's yeah. But it's, it's uh, but you, but you tell the truth, you can lose your job. Now, what kind of a nonsense is this? Yeah, it's like you're going against fact, like this basic science it's, fact, it's, like hey, there's, there's yeah, only two. You, there's you only just two. can't decide to be a man uh, when you're a woman one day. It's just you, that's against nature. You, two plus two can always will be four. You can think it's five, but it's not going to be. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And so today people think that whatever they do is fine. If I think I'm a horse, I'm gonna run around like a horse. I saw this woman on the YouTube. <laughs> Seriously. People that think they're a dog. People that think they can marry animals. And what else is next? Pedophilia, that we can have sex with little children? That that's already being in works. I mean, to say, I, I knew what the, 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 the gay marriage, I know this is all controversial, oh my gosh. But, but two men can get married. I'm sorry to say, but the sphincter is not a sexual organ. It wasn't made that way in nature. Okay. It's not complementary to each other. I, I don't want to go into this, but mm. you know what I'm saying to my And the people that are listening, they know exactly what I'm talking about, even if they don't want to admit it to, to one another. It's just those are the realities. Okay. And so uh, if you go against that, you're going to create chaos. And liberty is not that you, whatever you perceive to, to be, whatever you want to do at this particular moment, that it's some kind. No, you're slave to your passions. You're a slave. You're not free. You're a slave to whatever you decide that you think is right. Because you stop using your reason and, and you've been given over to complete insanity. And this is what's going on in this country. It's like insanity is taking over. Because what you see on the news and stuff, it's insane. They talk about it as if it's something normal. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy. Well, I'm not saying, look, I can't tell somebody, look, you can't be a man when you're a woman. I can, but I should be free to tell you. I should be free to voice my opinion instead of being shut down and not have any discussion. The reason we have like some of these shootings and stuff like that is because people are just simply, they don't have an outlet to talk about it. They get frustrated because they're shut down. Even if, because if it's an opposing a view and opinion, you know, uh, you, you can talk about political issues, then oh, I'm gonna go kill somebody. You understand? It's, it's all pent up inside. Also, there's no outlet for also it. That's part of the problem. I also think there's more factors to that than mm. just that. It's of course, of course, there are other other uh, especially psychological factors. factors. Psychological drugs. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's drug use, even legally uh, legal drugs. And so people are not hooked necessarily on heroin and cocaine or crack or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, just prescription drugs. A lot of the drugs that you think that uh, are supposed to help you actually cause depression, this and that. Yeah, the side effects. Yeah, side effects. So that also is a factor, you know. So the, and this is the reason society has all these problems because we we got rid of the we got rid of God, and we believe in all kinds of nonsense, new age stuff, witchcraft. Now Satanism is coming into forefront. What is Satanism? It's imitation of the Catholic Church in reverse. Why do they go to Catholic Church and steal the Eucharist, the sacrament, the Jesus in the cookie? <laughs> Jesus. Why? Because it's real. Because Christ is present in that. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. They don't go to Protestant Church. Nobody's interested in the Protestant Church. There's 30,000 denominations. There's like, what, 30,000 Holy Spirits? No, the Christ founded only the Catholic Church, and we threw the church out. And when the church goes, so do, so goes the society. There's nothing to unify us. You understand? There's no common credo. Saint Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, the doctor of the church, living in 1200s, said that society can only function 
if they have a common credo. If you don't have a common creed, you, know, you cannot function. Because all these opposing forces constantly working against one another. That's why leftism works on that. They constantly work. They have to have crisis. They, if, they can, if there is not one, they will create one. Have you ever heard of Saul Alinsky, for example? Okay. Okay. Well, look into it. Look it up. Saul Alinsky. The book for radicals. Constantly create strife. Obama was his pupil. You create groups, come up with uh, scenarios, crisis, uh, people constantly fighting one another, put them in this box and that box. And, and so there is always a division, never a unity. Okay, and so they think that by collapsing the present, the Christian order in the West at least, they're going to somehow out of that those ashes, they're going to create this a humanistic society where God is the human and the government and never going to work. We need that higher authority. We need God's precepts. God is a creator of, of all this that we see around us. He created the earth. He created you, your soul. He breathed into your body. We cannot do without him because you will mark my words 20 years from now. It's not going to get any better. The society cannot function. When you destroy family, especially, you destroy the state. The state is modeled on the family. The family is the, it's the nucleus, is, is the building block of a society. The tribe. Yeah. And if, and if you start confusing it, if you think that men and men can be a family and have children, and woman and woman, or multiple, or whatever, no. It's not going to work. So you have all these groups and all this chaos, all these creeds, everybody professes a different creed. You can never get united. That's why Muslims are so vehement about if you say anything bad about Muhammad, if you live in those countries, you're going to get killed because mm -hmm. they've learned that to keep, you have to keep a common creed. Now, I'm saying this is a good example that you're going to kill somebody who wants to convert to Christianity. Yeah. But... They understood it, and it was the same in medieval Europe. You know, if you're a heretic running around preaching anything than a gospel that the church taught, I, you know, they were not going to deal with you kindly either, because for the sake of the peace in the society, they had courts and they had inquisitions. Okay, it wasn't as severe as, for example, in Islam. Okay, mm -hmm. but but they did they did do that because they understood very well if there is no common. Uh, fact of the society, common creed, I like always come to that creed that you profess, then the society cannot exist. And this is what happened this is what happens to the Western society today, is that it's falling apart on account of this. So so we touch up many really, really touchy touchy subjects mm -hmm. that uh, uh, but we not need to be afraid to talk about them, you know. And in fact, we need to discuss these things. I could be wrong on some of the stuff. I can't cover everything, you know. I did, of course, but that, that's up for debate. That's that's why we. If you're a reasonable person, you will respect. I have many Muslim friends, for example, mm -hmm. because I compete in Muslim countries, yeah. and oftentimes I had discussions like these with them. Okay. But if you respect the other person, and I love many of them. Okay, they're great friends of mine. But this is what we need. We need to be able to talk to one another, being unafraid. And what they're trying to do to, to, to us today is that be afraid. Do not talk to one another. Keep your mouth shut. Just accept what is given to you from the top. Okay? And so that's wrong. We need to, we need to talk about this and, and uh, so we can find a common ground because the division is only going to cause disaster. You know? It's, there's no strength in, div in division or in multiculturalism. Look, you can, like in Europe, for example, today, uh, they say immigration is great and, you know, they bring these people from Africa and that are completely different culture. You bring it into, into Europe and a lot of them are not even willing to. I know because I was an immigrant. I saw it in my, my own kind. They came to America and they kind of stuck to another, crying on each other's shoulders, complaining about America. 
and it's like I told them, you know, what do you expect? Like they're gonna welcome you with the, you know, hey, you know, you're here, we're gonna give you, you know, job that pays hundred thousand dollars a year right away or something <laughs> like that. No. My dad and I left that. We just threw ourselves into the American culture and the society for what it's worth. Because we knew that was the only way to basically be part of America. You understand? Mm-hmm. And so they, they bring these like really foreign cultures into Europe. They're based on a completely different way of thinking, a completely different creed. It can never work. This multiculturalism is, is just, it's, it's, it's or it not working out. I mean, the thing is, that worked for America, though. We have, like, we have multiple cultures, multiple religions. I know, yeah, this is melting pot. It has to a certain worked. extent, especially, it worked, but we're starting to see it actually collapsing a little bit. How many people live off of uh, racism here, here, for example? Say that again. How many people live off of racism here? The so-called people that are against racism are the very ones that profit from it. Mm-hmm. Sharpton, Jackson, all these people. They don't want the racism to go by the wayside. Yeah, they're, they're um, fear mongers. Yeah, exactly. And what is this like white privilege stuff? I come from a culture, I never owned a slave. I come to live here, I want to get along with everybody and I, I have to be guilty of something because I'm they white. They do. That's absolutely ridiculous. That's, that's, that's racism also. And most... Um like most people, most generations now don't have fam- yeah. no, um, don't have ancestors that own slaves. Look, you come from a culture in Puerto Rico, for example, <coughs> where finally your people were catechized way back when your ancestors, mm-hmm. okay, the Indians, they became Catholics. You profess the same creed. Okay, since this is not about color, you understand. This is about creed. That color has nothing to do with it. And we try to divide by the color. And this is still happening in this country. And you go to Brazil, for example, nobody gives a shit what color you are. People get along just fine. But here I feel like I have to walk on eggshells all the time, you know? Like being afraid what you say in front of who, you know, you don't want to insult the black people. Because you can't talk about it openly. So uh, it's this... The color has nothing to do with anything, really. This is such a concept that's only, it's a political concept. Yeah, you know, there are, there will always be racists because you look different, you're dark skinned, so you don't look like me because I'm white, you mm-hmm. know, whatever. There are those bigots out there. You always find those in every culture. Right? It's like, and it goes the same for, for the blacks or, you know, anybody. You know, they're just, they can be just as racist as the white people. Just because the current injustice that's of 100 years ago was done mainly to them doesn't mean they're not capable of the same. It's a human nature. You know, it's a sinful human nature. It's a fallen human nature. So, there. So we we got way way off topic. <laughs> well, it's good good conversation, but like we we got way off the way off topic. So we go we go to a fun question. Huh? Okay, we go to a fun one. Um, here's one. If you wake up tomorrow and gain any power or ability, what, what would it be and why? Basically, if you wake up tomorrow with a superpower, what would I do with it? Yeah. I would try to fix things in the world, I guess. Uh, it depends what kind of a superpower it would be, I guess. That would depend very much on that. It would have to be more specific as to... Mm-hmm. Uh, Plus, any, anyone you want. <laughs> well, if God gave me the ability to convert people and to see things his way, mm-hmm. then I would like to go spread the gospel. That's what I would love to do. I would like everybody to know that Christ died for their sins. And that redemptive power of his sacrifice is there for them to take. That's a grace given by God. And that would unite the world and make us all really easy and uh, we would love each other. Now, that's not going to happen probably in this world. It's going to happen in the next. But that's if I had that superpower given to me by God, that's what I would do. Hmm. I mean, flying around like a superman. Superman obviously never fixed anything. You know, I mean, you, you fix <laughs> something, but it's like you patch one hole and then another one opens up in a hole of the ship on the other side. So it's like constant, you know. <laughs> It goes in circles. <laughs> um, oh, here's a good one. If you could travel in time into the future or the past, which would it be and why? Interesting. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I would love to travel perhaps to ancient Rome hmm. and to, to about 50 AD onward, some, someplace around that time, to see how it was when Christianity took root, okay, and the, the, the sort of the nature of the persecution. And uh, that or to medieval times, and, because there's so many things about medieval times that we either uh, idealize or do not understand how things really were, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? I, I, you know, there's so many things, that I, at so many places, it would be on the steps of Mongolia, I'd like to be there. You know, <laughs> I don't know, I cannot answer this straight. I mean, it, it's just that this is... Too this many interesting be, times. There would be too many places that I would like to go. Okay, <laughs> if I had the time machine, uh, I, I would just hop around. Just keep going. Let's <laughs> like, yeah, keep go going. Here, go there. Yeah, today this, today that. <laughs> I would like to see. I would like to see actually. Yeah, I would like to see how it really was. Okay, mm -hmm. do we have the history right? Yeah. So let's say I would have a topic. Okay, what happened in this battle? I'd like to go back there and Let's see, see what, what actually happened. happened you know. <laughs> so or this this particular affair that happened in I don't know year whatever. You know, did it really happen this way? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Something like that. So the time time machine, I would have to have a time machine to fly around. <laughs> Go back and forth. But, yeah, exactly. All right. Here's a, this one's a this one's a kind of a serious question. Mm -hmm. What was the most terrifying moment in your life? Most terrifying moment in my life. You know, I have to say that um, I have been very blessed in actually not having one. Mm -hmm. I've had difficult moments in my life, obviously. It's not so much growing up, but especially through the immigration, the, the very trying times. Mm -hmm. But I never really um, despaired. I always kind of thought that, you know, toughen up, take it as it is. It's not always going to be this way. I, I, I was only one time maybe danger of life being attacked by somebody but even that didn't freak me out I don't know maybe deep inside I always somehow trusted God that he would pull me out of it I I never had like uh, some kind of a, a, a traumatic stress to the point where it would like just be haunting me so no I, I mean I've seen death I've seen you know difficult things but uh, a lot of people will never experience but I never, it never like, you know, it never affected me to the point where, you know, I mean, I, even today, I mean, okay, if I had to die, well, I'd die, you know, okay, fine. I mean, I, I know what's waiting me on the other side. I know it's not the end. So um, if I live my life according to the precepts of God, I, I have nothing to worry about. I have the hope, you know, I don't despair. And sometimes I despair a little bit. Do I have the... Do I have things right? Am I really, you know, I mean, everybody goes, but I don't despair to the point where, like, you know, I would, I would get, to the, get to that point where I would have like a really terrifying moment. It's overwhelming. It's basically. overwhelming. I mean, you get scared, mm -hmm. you know, you had moments where, well, that was close. <laughs> like that. Um, yeah, that, I'm, that's, how, that's how I would answer it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is your most treasured memory? Hi, my most treasured memory. I, you know, I hate to say that, but uh, I, I go back to the religion. People are going to get tired of it and listen mm -hmm. to it. I'm coming back to the church. You know, first time seeing the the uh, the elevation and if people aren't familiar with the Catholic Church what does that mean elevation it's when, during the consecration of the bread and wine when priest lifts the host up mm -hmm. which is the moment when Christ was crucified because the mass is representation of the Calvary in an unbloody manner mm -hmm. okay. so that was the moment that was that moment of reversion back to the faith back coming back to the church I think that's like the, the the moment, yeah. So, yeah, that's how we would answer it. Okay. What's the biggest sacrifice you made in your life? 
biggest sacrifice. Yeah, I made many sacrifices. But I do have to say I've been really blessed also that uh, at least I look at it. I No matter what difficulties I have went through or if I made any sacrifice, I never looked at it as like being the biggest or great. I, I never thought of it in those terms. Um, biggest sacrifice. One of the biggest sacrifices was basically leaving my country mm. into the unknown, leaving everything behind, you know, leaving with... Uh, Coming to America with a suitcase of like you know worn out clothes and not knowing what's going to be tomorrow, so that kind of a sacrifice that you left everything behind your family. The family got divided. My sister and my mother stayed behind because the whole family couldn't go. They wouldn't let you go to the West, you know. As a whole family, it was impossible. So we knew we we're going to se get separated. We just didn't know it was going to take five years to get reunited. And probably if my dad knew, he would probably never leave. So. So I guess that was, but I was kind of giddy. I was young, you know, so I, I was ready to fight and I was ready to overcome anything. You know, you're, you're an idealist, you know, when you're young, you have the carriage and the strength. That's why you go into military. <laughs> <laughs> I need that attitude in the military like you're invincible. Yeah, so that, I, I think that would be the, that. Okay. When was the first time you fell in love? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I was a little kid. There was this little redhead in a <laughs> kindergarten. <Little> red. <laughs> in a kindergarten, and uh, her name was Lutzing, L L Lucia, L Lucia, Lutzinka, because mm -hmm. we have diminutives, you know, for the name. I remember her very vividly till today. And all I can see is this redhead, and I was kind of like enchanted with this girl. But then, really, uh, it wasn't until like my late teens, I, I met this girl from, she was from America. She was a daughter of immigrants mm -hmm. who immigrated in 1968 into to America. He was a, a professor at the University of Austin. I forget of what, I think mathematics, if I'm not mistaken. And this was back in the um, uh, late 70s. She came for a visit because that was still part of the family in Czech Republic, in Prague. I, I, I got to meet her, and I fell in love with her. I mean, it was like love at first sight. I was crazy about this girl. And we had, for a couple of summers, she would come back. We had, you know, holding hands and all this, like, really innocent stuff. There was none of this, like, you know, 13-year-olds having sex nowadays. <laughs> no, this was really naive. It was a sweet stuff. Yeah, it was really... Uh, I, it was a different society, even under communism. There was still that perception of, oh, this thinking that we were still innocent, you know. And it wasn't unusual for people to fall in love and not necessarily have sex, you know. To be a 20, year, 20 years old and be a virgin was not that uncommon. <laughs> so that, that, you know, I was like my 17, 18, I was like something like that, yeah. So this was the girl. Yeah. I, what happened to her? I have no idea. She's if she's still in Austin. Last time I heard, she was actually in Prague, uh, working for an American newspaper. They're like for the local the, the expat expats that mm -hmm. are living in, in like in Prague. And I meet a lot of those when I go there because yeah. I travel to Czech Republic quite a bit. So it's funny to talk to Americans that live in Czech Republic. <laughs> you know. Um, I think she was working for that paper. Whether she sold us or not, I don't know. It'd be interesting to meet her. So there. All right. So this is the last question. I ask this question to everyone. It's a serious question, mm -hmm. and it's a two-parter. So, what is the worst thing you have ever done in your life, and what is the best thing you have ever done in your life? Oh my gosh, the worst thing that I have ever done in my life. Let me think. That's like going to confession to a priest. <laughs> <laughs> except, except he keeps it to himself. He can't divulge to anybody. But then this is like public here. Uh, what's the worst thing that I have done that I should be ashamed of? It's something that I, we, we call this sin. <laughs> okay. So there's this one thing that I remember vividly. I had a best friend. He was my best friend when I was a kid. For many, many years. We were best friends until I, we parted company when I immigrated. 
And he had this little knife. You know how boys are about yeah. pocket knives. Mm-hmm. You know when you're growing up, right? You want to have your yeah, you want the little tool. Well, he had this. It wasn't a pocket knife, but it was like the 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 handle was made of like cow horn. It was this, it was a small blade, and it had a cow horn a sheath. Okay, it was just beautiful craftsmanship. And I coveted this thing that he had, and it got to the point where I was like willing to even forfeit our relationship, this friendship that we had just for the sake of having that knife. And I stole it from him and I hid it, you know, and, and he was so distraught over it, you know, like, Oh, you know, it's like, it's my dad's. He gave it to me. And it's like, cause I, I came out with some story. Oh, I was playing with it in the, in the grass. Some mm-hmm. place fell, you know, I came up with some concoctions and I felt so bad that, you know, he went home crying, and it's like, so two days later, my conscience got better off again. <laughs> and I dug it up, and I said, I came up with another lie. I found it. Here it is. I never told him I stole him. I never told till today, I never told him. But I gave it back to him. So they kind of, you know, they, they kind of like stayed with me. Um, it's kind of like a little bit of guilt in the residual. I well, confessed it. Well, a lesson. Yeah. I confessed it since. And uh, the best thing, I don't know, what's the best thing I've done in my life? I'm still waiting for that one. <laughs> That's about the best I can tell you. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that one. I mean, best thing. You know, you try to do the best, you know, but is it the best thing? That's a question. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that that's my answer. All right. Juan, thank you for letting me come to your house and do this interview. Sure thing. Um, for anyone who wants to come find you on your for your website, so they can buy buy a couple bows and yeah, take a yeah. lesson. Yeah. What website is it? It's they can go to salukibow.com. Basically, mm-hmm. they'll find out all the information there, the contact information and information about what I do, the, the types of bows, um, the training for the horseback archery, or just ground archery for that matter. Yeah, and I'll put the the website link on the episode description so you guys can find it. Sure. Uh, I want to thank you again for letting me come here and do the interview. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you guys for listening. And don't forget to buy my novel, The Maledictions of Blue and Glass. It's available on Amazon as a print or a ebook edition. You can go on the, the podcast website and find a link for it. Thank you guys again for listening. I hope you have a great week. All right. Hey, we got some.